So hey guys, welcome back to my channel, here's part 2, what if Dekka had a dark light quirk? So without any ado, let's get into the fanfic. Lights out. That damn dream again. Lights out. Of all the things Katsuki Bakugu remembered from that day, it wasn't the hits or the cuts. Lights out. It wasn't the pain or even the humiliation. Lights out. It was those words. Lights out. Two simple words that wouldn't have meant much, especially from Deku of all people, but it did. It was the very last words that were said by his former friend to him before he went away but not before throwing Katsuki's entire life into disarray and dealing a major blow, and several, to both his body and mind. Katsuki literally had the scars to prove it but what really cut deep and continued to cause him anguish was the blow to his ego. Deku, no Izuka Midoriya unknown to anyone, and at a time even himself, had in fact beaten him. That day, he tried not to remember but he could never forget the greatest, and only relevant, fight in his young life, against a former friend he thought was useless. A fight that, in the end, he had lost. At first he was in denial, his brain purposefully protecting his pride by conveniently forgetting the last few moments before he passed out. He didn't remember it until a year later when he and his two minions were talking about an interview with All Might and how hard it was when he fought his first villain, way back when he was just a fresh graduate from Yui Academy. That made Katsuki think how his first fight with a villain would go, then it veered into his first real fight and eventually he got to thinking of his fight with Deku and at that point the memory, the pain, the humiliation wasn't so fresh. It was buried under more praises from his peers, ridicule of the useless Deku who ran away after getting beaten up and disappointment from his parents and teachers on how he picked on the poor boy. It made him annoyed remembering the lecture and a very idle thought pass him by wonder what those idiots would think if Deku was the one who beat me up. It was a stray thought meant as a joke of a joke but that was the catalyst for a suppressed memory to be dredged up and then he remembered. Annoyance turned to disbelief then denial and so much cursing but the memory took root and it haunted him for the better part of the same week. That's when the nightmares started, all of them involving those two accursed words that if used in conjunction would set him off faster than a bomb triggered by a dead man's switch. The worst part of it was that the object of his ire wasn't there so he couldn't very well do anything about it. So he was left to stew in his own defeat at the hands of useless Deku which he didn't handle well. That week saw him more agitated, angry as hell and easily provoked than he'd ever been. It was as if he was subconsciously gearing to prove his superiority at every turn. Talk to him a certain way, give him a certain look, make certain movements, anything that could be perceived as challenging his might was met with a swift, brutal and, for the most part, very physical response. And you better believe no one was safe, not his friends, not his followers, not even his teachers and especially his parents whom have put up with his attitude whether through his father's passive behavior or his mother's biting tongue and lack of fear for reprisals. Then he challenged the latter's authority by hitting back. That was, in hindsight, the worst mistake of his life as Katsuki was reminded why he let his mom get away with hitting him, the same reason why she lets him get away with cursing like a drunken sailor and calling her names. She doesn't step out of line but he did and after she was done with him, Katsuki thought less of his loss against Deku which was close as he now compared it to his loss against his mother, which went about as well as you think it did. The months following, after his wounds healed, were the moments where Katsuki turned inward, he was still the mean, cocky bastard with an attitude on the outside but he responded less with others now, especially when they praised him. The words of encouragement, the compliments, all of it was hollow and meaningless to him. Well, he'd received them so much that they did lose meaning a long time ago, but in the face of his loss against Deku they were more akin to pity. Then he did something he'd never done before and started to think, like really think about his goal and about his fight. It didn't take him long to figure that if he wanted to be the best then he would have to beat Deku. Should those ever be uttered then he would either be a laughing stock or be congratulated for the funniest joke of the year. So for a while he remained quiet and through his introspection he started thinking more about the boy known as Midori Izuku. He's under no illusion that Deku didn't actually want to or rather he did not plan to fight him that day. Really it was Katsuki's fault for pushing him but can you blame him? Deku never fought back and once upon a time when he did, he was too pathetic to do much. 
So how did he manage to win? Simple, Deku was, as much as it pained him to admit, smarter than him. It reflected in his grades and though no one gave him any credit for it Katsuki actually respected him a little because of it. He could, secretly, acknowledge that much. He knew what Deku wrote in his little black notebook too, or at least from the few times he got a glimpse at it, and others. They were ideas, musings, plans or what have you, of different quirks, their strengths, weaknesses, possible counters and so on. Katsuki has no doubt that somewhere Deku kept a profile of him. After all the times he's used his quirk against him, who wouldn't in his situation. Also Deku is the only one who knew him as a person, as a friend. It took longer to admit but Katsuki realized that of all the persons he knew Deku was the one he most perceived as a threat, and it showed in his fight. He won't even go into his quirk, or whatever the hell that was inside the storage shed. Izuku had him dead to rights, and he suspected that the only reason why the guy passed out too was due to lack of stamina. Deku was just weak like that. So what did he learn from his introspection of the whole ordeal? Deku is a crafty son of a bitch, who used his perceived weakness to lure him into a false sense of security, lead him into an obvious trap and proceeded to concoct a plan which he crudely executed. The worst part of it was that it was on the fly completely unexpected and Katsuki fell for it beautifully. Now Deku was gone, having stripped him of his belief as being the best and the chance to rectify it by challenging him again. Of course he could seek him out but his parents aren't in as much contact with Inko anymore and even if they were they wouldn't tell him their address which leaves Katsuki by himself. Now what was he supposed to do? Katsuki thought of it for a while, now that Deku, the only person who he had, subconsciously, perceived as a threat was no longer there, he had nothing to challenge him anymore. The indignity of his loss aside Katsuki felt a sense of emptiness. What should he do now other than sit back and wait? The answer was so simple and yet it came to him during a conversation with his mother at a time where he was simply lost on what to do with himself. Predictably his mother was all over his lazy ass, complaining about his lack of productivity. And through her tirade the only thing that registered was his name. What did you just say? Mitsuki cut her tirade short when she got a reaction that was not him yelling as loud as she did. She didn't let it get to her too much though. I said why can't you be more like Izuku? He shot to his feet. What about Deku? Mitsuki's eyes widened at the fire in his eyes and she smirked. I've been talking to his mother lately. While you're here sitting on your lazy ass he's out exercising very day, even practicing with his quirk. The anger melted into open mouth shock as his mind raced he's been, this entire. Arg. The screen caught Mitsuki off guard as did when he bolted through the door. Katsuki! Her yell fell on deaf ears as the only thing he could hear was the sound of his mind and thumping heart as he continued running. He knew not the destination, but he just kept running. He's been training. This entire time Deku has been training. That fucker! Of course he has. When he acknowledged Izuku was the only one to know him as a friend the same went in reverse. Katsuki had Deku pegged as well and when he thought about things, it only made sense. That guy, most of his life had been spent adoring heroes. Hell they both wanted to be like heroes and when he finally caught a glimpse of his quirk he worked damn hard to make it happen. So why in the hell would he think Izuku motherfucking Midoriya would sit on his ass and do nothing until it was time to enroll in Yui? Shit! He slammed an explosive fist into a wall causing it to explode outwards, but he didn't care. What the hell have I been doing? He could care less that his mother favored Izuku over him, but to say that the scrawny bastard had been training all this time. He's getting stronger and I'm still. He trailed as his anger was expressed in another explosion. After venting his anger and stress he resolved to do something about it. He was going to be number one but before that could happen he needed to beat Deku and as he is, right now, Katsuki had his doubt that if he were to fight the scrawny puke now then it wouldn't be an easy win, if at all, and with each day the gap gets wider. In Katsuki's mind it was inconceivable for him to lose as he is but he's thinking of Izuka as he was and as of now he could only imagine how strong he is now. Exercising every day? He'll do one better than that bastard. Everything that Izuka does he'll do twice as much, he'll surpass him and be the best. But to do that, as much as he hated it, 
he would need to at least have a grasp of what Izuka was doing. As appealing as it sounds to just work till he dropped in hopes that he was doing more than Izuka thus become stronger than him, Katsuki wasn't stupid. Brash, arrogant, foul-mouthed but not stupid and overworking himself till he collapsed was just insane. This wasn't an anime, basic yet extreme strength training won't guarantee godlike strength and invincibility. If it's one thing his loss against Deku did it was teaching him that going into a fight without a plan beyond blow shit up and hope for the best doesn't cut it. Not with a guy like Deku and he knew Deku. No he'll have to be crafty about it, and what better way to be crafty than to counter everything Deku has. And the first step is to know how the bastard was going about training himself and his quirk and work to create contingencies. The problem was that he'll have to bargain with the devil. What? From her lounging position on the couch and magazine on her chest Mitsuki gave her son a surprised look. Katsuki was rather annoyed by that. What you going see now you old Haji H? He rubbed his face with a wince but glared at her. Familiar red eyes glared back. I heard what you said idiot. She then continued calmer. I just want to know why you want to know what Izuku is up to. None of your business. Well tough shit. I ain't telling you nothing until I get an answer and don't even bother asking your father either. He doesn't care to know what me and my friends are up to. Shit. She had him and he knew it but he wasn't about to cave. Forget it. Mitsuki simply shrugged, sweet yourself. Katsuki decided to wing it in the end lots of running, push-ups, sit-ups and drinking plenty of juice. Days turned into weeks turned into months and the entire time he'd hear himself asking the same question. What would Deku do? How would he go about getting this done? If the name of the game is Beat Deku then it only makes sense that he'd want to know how the guy thought. Admittedly it was the most Katsuki had ever had to think about something and it pissed him off that he had to stoop so low as to think like someone else. But you know what pissed him off even more? Losing. So in the end he sucked it up and thought long about it. Well he knew that Izuku knew that he wouldn't let his loss stand. He shook his head no if I know him he wouldn't even think he won that fight he thought remembering how his former friend looked that day. That wasn't the eyes of someone who got into an unplanned fight with Katsuki Bakugu and won by the skin of his teeth. With that thought he figured Izuku wasn't training to beat him specifically, probably. It was a small comfort at least, still didn't mean shit since Deku probably had enough notes on him and his quirk. With that thought he needed to go beyond Deku's expectations and develop countermeasures against his countermeasures which would mean quirk training i.e. special moves. He grinned at the thought of blasting the nerd with an awesome move but before he could develop the special move, he'd need to study what he was up against. Which brought up the second hardest part of his Deku investigation. What the hell is his quirk? The first time he saw Deku's quirk, it was a little flash of light. Then he heard it was that he could absorb sunlight like some kind of solar battery and release it. He figured that was what the explosion was back then. A few years later he could allegedly make his palms glow. Of course Katsuki had never actually seen him use his light-based quirk no matter how much he tried to force it out of him. Then fast forward today and... that happened. Seriously what the fuck? What the actual fuck? That what happened in the storage room was not a light-based quirk. The shit that he'd seen when he actually lit the place up with explosions. Shudder. Shit. He grabbed his head in frustration. Bad enough that he lost his first real fight. To make it worse it was against Deku of all people and to add insult to injury he was fucking traumatized by it. No he shook his head. It wasn't just pride on the line anymore. He needed to mop the floor with Deku. For his pride and his damn health. Stupid brain. So it was with that Katsuki found himself around a computer searching for quirks revolving around manipulating darkness, or as the technical term goes, umbrakinesis. The search brought up some data although there wasn't much on the account that that specific type of quirk was rare. Plus people with that type of quirk more than not end up as villains because dark quirks make people dark. Shit that wasn't even a stereotype but an actual scientifically proven fact. The type of energy that is generated by darkness affects the brain chemistry in such a way that it brings to surface certain negative emotions, change in demeanor, and in some cases just pure insanity. That made Katsuki pause. Well shit, no wonder Deku sucker punched me. It also explained why most of the quirk users were villains. 
Now that opened a can of worms to another impossible yet plausible question that popped up in his head. Is Deku's quirk going to turn him into a villain? If it was enough to make him do all that then could it, somewhere down the line, transform that useless bastard into a seriously dangerous villain? Pfft, yeah right. He had to scoff at he thought, not even going into how ludicrous it sounded for Deku to be a villain of all things, Katsuki himself couldn't imagine Deku would ever think to be a villain. Just look at Katsuki. With his quirk and attitude he's as close to being a villain to anyone who would skim his profile. For fuck's sake he already has minions though he didn't hang around them for long. Back to the point, Deku wouldn't be a villain, at least if he were left to his own devices, dark powers or not. If Katsuki could be a hero then you better believe Deku can as well and without Katsuki to keep him in check then there is literally nothing holding the guy back from pursuing that dream, dark quirk be damned. Speaking of quirk, while on the topic of quirks Katsuki felt that he still hadn't grasped Deku's quirk, not fully at least. Oh he had enough memories and evidence for his dark powers but still, if that was all then what's with that light shit then? Naturally Google was his only friend and when he typed in light explosion and dark control, his views on quirk expanded as the search engine showed something peculiar that surprised him. Dual quirks. In all honesty Katsuki didn't even think that was a thing, though he knew it existed. Having more than one ability in a single quirk, it is usually found in mutant type quirks. Or it could be a side effect of a quirk, like in his case because his explosion quirk is just as lethal to him as it can be for others his body compensates by developing thicker skin. Katsuki will in theory have very durable skin especially around his palms. But the actual definition of dual quirks what Katsuki found told a different story from what Katsuki was aware of. Having two quirks manifest that aren't inherently similar to each other. These were the rarest of the rare type of things, so rare that the number of documented cases could be counted on one hand. There was the fairly known ability to turn invisible and generate force field. He remembered that heroine very well from the so-called Silver Age of Quirk heroes. Then there was that one villain who had super speed and could generate fire. That guy is incarcerated at the moment. Finally there was a recent guy who could do zero-point manipulation, which is the ability to render all things motionless by trapping them in a field which he could move around at will, an aggressive regeneration. Katsuki wouldn't lie. Having one of those powers could make someone dangerous but having two of them, and they are almost unstoppable. That aside it still frustrated him because there was so little examples of them that it wasn't likely he would find what he was looking for, and he wasn't about to go read up on the many theories so-called experts have come up with. Then he thought fuck it, might as well try and looked up dark and light quirks. What came up aside from some sites was the caption did you mean light versus dark? More than a little intrigued he clicked on it and the first thing that generated of all things was an article based on a book. Light vs. Dark, The Tragedy of the Reynolds Family. This got an eyebrow raised at the familiarity of it. The name Reynolds sounded familiar. Out of curiosity he clicked on the article. By the time he finished reading it he leaned back in his chair and muttered, Holy shit. The article was an overview of the book was based on true events, mostly journal notes, eyewitness accounts, Public records everything in the book was authenticated and extensively researched, documented, and proven. The book is a biography of one Robert and Ryan Reynolds a.k.a. the Reynolds brothers or their more famous aliases, The Sentry and The Void. Now those names Katsuki recognized, oh there is not an aspiring hero or villain who wouldn't recognize those names. Arguably the first humans in recorded history to have developed quirks and the very first hero and villain respectively. Everything that is now started with those two, their actions shaped the foundations for other quirk users and for better or worse their ideals still held firm. Or at least that's what one analyst said, Katsuki was less interested in the history and more in their quirks. When Robert Reynolds was born his body shined in a golden light so bright that the hospital lights wouldn't compare. Of course this made the papers as a sign from the heavens, on the contrary his brother was born soon after completely normal. Later on in their life Robert's quirk would evolve from glowing brightly to manipulating and generating light, while Ryan would be able to do the opposite and control and generate darkness in all its forms. 
By themselves those quirks were some of the rarest, and the two brothers cemented themselves as the most powerful hero and villain in history with the feats they pulled off during their respective careers thanks mostly to those quirks. And now there's a very good chance that Deku has both of those quirks under his control. Again. What the actual heck? Katsuki was in a state of disbelief, that the most useless and weak guy he knew ended up like that. At the same time he felt reinvigorated. Oh sure he acknowledged that the Reynolds twins were insanely powerful with their quirks but strip away all that, and what's left is Deku and while the guy is crafty he makes for a far less imposing face than those two legends. He gulped. I'm going to surpass All Might and that means I'll surpass you too. He pointed at the picture of the century. A lofty goal with almost no chance of being accomplished, but as the saying goes, dream big or don't dream at all. For the rest of the year Katsuki worked on quirk development, researching extensively on his fitness and quirk techniques, even going so far as to draw inspiration from heroes, never villains, with similar quirks. And through blood, sweat and sheer fucking will he develop several new techniques that would definitely blow Deku's expectations, along with his body, out of the water. Because that's what it's all about. Deku would be expecting the Katsuki he left behind, but unlike him, Katsuki was expecting the unexpected. Deku would never catch him flat footed again, and he worked twice as hard as he had any business to. His parents approved of his new ethic, and he would be lying if he said he didn't value their praises above others. Not to say that even if the incident didn't happen, he would have just lazed around doing nothing for three years. Fuck no. Katsuki actually had it all planned out exercising, quirk and combat training then some studying to top it all off. Katsuki is deathly serious about being the best and will quite literally destroy anyone who stands in the way of that. Really the only thing that's changed in that regard is the amount of load he placed on himself, and of course his new immediate focus defeating Deku. Add all of that together and Katsuki was actually ahead of schedule, making progress he thought he'd only see himself making in Yui right now. He wouldn't be surprised if he could fight against some villains and come out on top. He wouldn't though. Contrary to popular belief Katsuki is very much a realist but with possibly the best damn poker face in the world. After all who's going to take the loud mouth, short-tempered brat serious when he's always talking big. Aside from that Katsuki doesn't have any formal combat training let alone combat experience and by combat he's talking about the kind that wasn't ended by spamming his quirk like a broken special move in a video game. Now that he thought about it he hasn't gotten into a fight that didn't end with him simply blowing his opponent up since Deku. He didn't know whether that said something about Deku or how far he's come or the peasants who even bother try but it's very sad indeed when someone says that Deku put up more of a fight than anyone before or since. Anyway his lack of combat training was going to be taken care of by someone of a specialist before. Katsuki would have learned the basic self-defense course for aspiring adolescents wanting to become heroes. They actually have that, and though his parents weren't wealthy they did have a savings put away for all of Katsuki's future hero needs so paying for the class wasn't a problem. At least it wasn't before but after taking and subsequently acing that class Katsuki was still left unsatisfied. Sure he learned a lot of basic combat moves but they were just that, basic and he would more than likely have to rely on his quirk plus additional training at Yui. It seemed that the class itself was more for getting used to actually being in combat situations, and not lock up than for practicality. It pissed him off and he complained very loudly and incessantly about it which did let him blow off some steam but still left him with a problem. He needed training, combat training, martial arts training, that last one came up from the back of his mind when he was going through his father's DVD collection on one of the more boring days. For a pussy his father liked his action movies. But it didn't really stuck until he got wind from his mother that Deku was on the hunt for dojos. The look on his mother's face when she let that one slip wanted him to do unspeakable things but he let it go in favor of mulling over the new information. Katsuki knew for a fact that Deku wouldn't be finding any dojos and he knew that Inko wouldn't be able to afford a private instructor. What really had him was that the guy would even think of that. Then there's the other information of a friend helping him practice. Deku got himself a training partner shit. As much as Katsuki was content training by himself he could recognize the benefits of having a sparring partner as opposed to being alone. Deku is humble and open enough to have included a like-minded person in his training but not Katsuki. 
First of all, he didn't acknowledge anyone in his class in the school to be near enough to his level to allow such a thing. Even if he did then they would have to be able to keep up with his kind of training, bear with his attitude, and be tough enough to withstand him. That lowers Katsuki prospects to a partner to be a strong and stubbornly persistent person who is invulnerable to explosions and insults. So in short, a crazy motherfucker and Katsuki don't deal with crazies. As for the dojo bit Katsuki knew that after quirks became widespread, such things like martial arts and self-defense became outdated in the face of having superpowers. Only the wealthier ones managed to maintain their standing but only in the form of private tutoring where they teach their styles in coalition with someone's quirk. In most cases a reputable dojo would contract with an organization to teach its members their art. Katsuki knows for a fact that China's Hero School did this. Not just as a lucrative business, but it's also encouraged by the government in order to preserve a piece of their culture. It's a wonder why China has one of the lowest villain sightings in the world, to the point where their heroes actually migrate. Japan's government tried to do something similar, but by the time it was implemented most of the dojos had already shut down. That and the people just weren't interested in the martial arts anymore despite the boon it would give to its heroes. It shouldn't have been that much of a problem but the downside is that it's more expensive especially if it's to be done by a private citizen as opposed to sponsored ones. That's what he managed to find out after some research just to get a better understanding of Deku's prospects. With that said Katsuki wasn't interested in martial arts per se and by that he meant like the ones in movies, you know, flips, kicks, throws, chops and all that. As tempting and aesthetic as being like Jackie Chan would be he's smart enough to know his quirk and fighting style wouldn't mesh with that type of fancy fighting. Oh no he knew which martial art he should use to best maximize his particular set of skills and lucky for him this one isn't extinct or specialized. The moment he entered through the door Katsuki could tell he walked into the right place. Exercising equipment of all types were in a designated area. Mats and lots of punching bags of different types were also present but at the center of the area was a boxing ring. Katsuki couldn't help it. He grinned at seeing two men duke it out in a no quirks brawl. Now this is what I'm talking about. With the rise of quirks certain sports began to lose their appeal to the general public. It's the reason why the Olympics eventually became defunct and replaced with quirk-centered events hosted by major hero schools or organizations around the world which include Yi of course. The only sports to survive this were mostly contact sports that could be adapted with quirks and of course have an audience that watch for more than just entertainment, i.e. gambling. Boxing is all of that, and while it isn't as popular as it once was it has adapted into this modern-day society. Out of everything Katsuki couldn't see Deku doing boxing, it's one of those few things that doesn't take quirks into consideration at first glance, especially projection-type quirks. That would mean Katsuki's quirk wouldn't matter here. No one would sing him meaningless praises at this place. That was all right though. He was big enough to do boxing probably even go pro if he wanted but he'll go as far as he can until Yui or graduation. For now though he will focus on the task at hand. Hey old man, you looking for a new member? A semester and two months into his second year passed since he joined the local gym. Turns out Katsuki was a prodigy at the sport. Hell he's even fought in some matches. Three in fact against older, more experienced boxers and won all of them with a knockout. Aside from his accomplishments in the ring, he managed to implement the sport into his combat style, which was still in the experimenting stage, but looking very good nonetheless. He even managed to get the hang of a few special moves, and it would only get better from here on out. With true accomplishments and growing progress, Katsuki's future was looking brighter, as did the prospect of his goal. Nothing could bring him down now. Katsuki! Apparently he has spoken too soon. Why do you want ya old granny? He yelled back. Shut up. That was expected but her bypassing him wasn't. It said something about his relationship with their relationship that he knew something was wrong when she didn't hit him after he insulted her age. With the way how his mother looked he was the last thing on her mind. What the hell is going on? His voice was naturally harsh but lost most of its bite. He was curious. Her mother threw on a coat and grabbed her car keys. There was a villain attack. Inko and Izuku are in the hospital. Katsuki's normally hot blood froze at the news and he raced out the door behind his mother all the while his mind tried to wrap itself around the situation then swearing bloody murder against the shit-stained villain who'd attack Inko. 
and Deku if he failed to protect her. To be continued. Author's Notes I feel like I hadn't accomplished what I set out for in writing this chapter. Why? In writing this chapter one went back and read almost every scene Katsuki was in and found out a few things. First of all because of his attitude I've seen authors portray him as two-dimensional which is kind of fine because a guy like that didn't really get any proper depth until recently. At the same time his actions in earlier chapters spoke for itself. I mean the guy is pretty badass when you look past his treatment of Izuku and attitude. When the villains first attacked he was one of the few who didn't panic and calmly surveyed the situation and acted accordingly, to his whims. He's also got some combat training before Yuri, he has heightened reflexes and managed to incapacitate a villain on instinct, not to mention performing a corkscrew flip and throw Todoroki in their fight, the guy is also a pretty decent strategist if not quick to jump the gun. Honestly I feel I didn't really do much to change his character from canon on the outside because he actually learns from his mistakes but just doesn't show it in an obvious sense. I pretty much did with Katsuki what I did with Izuku and made him mature earlier, and I gave the reason, he has an immediate goal in mind that pushes him further than his canon counterpart. The bit about specialized training I added to give some focus on where he learned his bit of self-defense, that is not explained but the boxing bit is something I added as a way for him to combat Izuka's martial arts. And yes I got that one from pride of a loser I'm not ashamed to admit that. I find it interesting that there is no longer an Olympics but instead the Yui festival thing. I doubt Yui is the only school doing that or that there aren't any other quirk events broadcasting. If I get the chance I might add on to that prospect. Since some people have wondered I am going to confirm. Izuka will not, I repeat, will not be receiving one for all. Take note that I am basing this story off the fact that the world doesn't revolve around the main character. Get used to the fact that some things in canon aren't likely to happen, for example Ochako, don't assume that their relationship will be the same as canon and while the thought of an harem, for those wondering, have crossed my mind realistically I know it's not going to be smooth sailing. Keep an open mind is all I'm saying. Yellow eyes watched with rapt attention mixed with awe at the spectacle before them. Sitting on the Tadama mat with legs folded so as to not appear indecent Himiko watched the two figures dance in a complex series of punches, kicks, palm strikes, blocks, evasion, redirection and all manner of other techniques she had really only seen in kung fu movies. As expected Izuki gives his all with everything. Whether it's mastering his quirk, studying heroics, training for combat, or even a simple date Izuki tries to give 110%. When she said combat experience this wasn't what she meant but only Izuka could take learn self-defense and turn it into become a kung fu master. Speaking of, looks like the spar is about to end. Spar would be too kind of a word though this was more like a brutal practical lesson. For a kindly looking old man Silver was old school with the lessons, like really old school. At a certain point in a disciple's training they would have an evaluation and since Izuka was the only student, with Himiko only wanting to watch Izuka work, the teacher took it upon himself to personally evaluate the boy. By having a spar that incorporates everything he's learned these past several months and brutally exploiting any flaws or weaknesses while giving harsh, yet helpful, commentary. Nice evasion. With a front kick which Bang easily blocked, Izuka gained some distance before settling into a stance, one which Silver copied. She should be protesting this but... Not fast enough. This time he won on the offensive, and he only managed to get a single fist out before it was deflected. A moment later a kick hit the back of his knee forcing him into a half-kneeling position with a single leg. That same leg came up and smacked him in the side of the face forcing him to stumble back again, and somehow managed to block a third side kick before getting hit on the shoulder dash. Oh. She has a vested interest in Izuka being hurt. Your stance is too stiff. Silver kicked his shin from under him causing the boy to fall. He used the momentum to do a roundhouse kick which missed its mark by a mile, sloppy, and before he could even properly stand Silver delivered a chop to his chest that made him hit the tatami. Izuku tried to kip up quickly to catch him unawares but was stomped back down when Silver performed a spinning axe kick to the chest. Oof! Besides her needs. Izuku crawled away but got to his feet when Silver continued on the offensive. He managed to deflect all the well-placed strikes. Well done. 
but failed to avoid the sudden leg sweep that had him falling to the ground. Someone is going to have to nurse Azuka back to health. Said boy rolled away and to his feet, but again went on the offensive with noticeable sluggishness. Useless, Silver slapped away his hands and delivered a palm strike to his face. Izuku, who was barely even standing, actually spun from the momentum of the strike slap, before dropping like a tree that's been cut down. And that's my cue. Izuku! She rushed over to his side with handkerchief in hand and laid his head on her lap then began wiping away the blood with a concerned expression. Did you have to hit him so hard, old man? She said bitingly. We already know you're better than him. You don't need to remind us. Silver rolled his eyes. It wasn't that bad and he could heal those minor injuries in mere minutes besides. He stroked his chin a little while looking at his disciple. Both of you shouldn't be complaining since you both get something out of it. He gave her a look that conveyed his unsaid words. You get to nurse him back to health and Izuku has the privilege of being cared for by his girlfriend. Himiko clicked her teeth in annoyance TCH, so he saw through me after all. At that moment Izuku must have realized the soft sensation under his head wasn't a pillow and sat up with a groan. Ugh, it's okay I learned that sensei has to hit me at least that hard or else my quirk would just revitalize me and the fight would end up getting dragged out unnecessarily, like last time. Himiko frowned and gently forced his head back to her lap. Well I'm sorry if I worry about you Izuku. Then she swooped down like a hawk and her lips caught bruised injury that just so happened to have a blood stain. When she came back up the bruise and blood was gone. They're all better. She smiled a bit widely. Now I just have to get the others. The kiss must have did more than cure his boo-boo because Izuku sprang up with a shout. T that's all right Himiko. He held his hands up front while backing away slowly. This did little more than amuse the blonde whose expression took on a teasing tone. Ah, uh, but Izuka my way is a lot more fun. Gulp. And I'll make sure to get every spot. She licked her lips in a way no miner should be able to. No words could describe the white noise static that was Izuka's mind in that moment. I'll remind you too that there are no illicit behaviors allowed in my dojo. Silver remarked dryly while walking away. Himiko looked at the man's back with irritation before looking back at Izuku except he wasn't there. Where? He left when you took your eyes off him. There was a breeze and Himiko's head turned to door in time to see it slammed shut. Him, his recovery time has increased, Silver noted as he stared at his watch. Himiko simply giggled into her sleeve and followed after him. A sigh of content escaped his lips as Izuka let the rays of the almost setting sun shine down upon his now exposed torso. He'd done it so many times that he could almost feel every moment of the gradual change of his body as it heals itself. Izuku was pretty sure he could estimate how long it would take to heal a particular damage. He plopped down onto the ground then winced. The bruises were healing but slowly especially since the sun is in its early stages of setting. Ao sensei really did a number on me. Well what did you expect when you told him you couldn't handle it? He jumped at the close proximity of the voice and yelped when a hand pulled him back down to the ground except instead of feeling the floorboards it was a soft cushion that Izuku recognized as Himiko's supple thighs. And soon enough the aforementioned girl came into his view. Himiko looked down with a small grin. Feeling better? A little. He stammered relinquishing eye contact. He didn't get up though. No, he found some time ago that Himiko liked skinship and giving lap pillows as much as any teenage boy would like getting one from a cute girl. And though it's sort of embarrassing Izuku couldn't deny he very much liked Himiko's lap pillows, he would have liked it better in private but that's just the kind of person his girlfriend is. Or was it failed to mention that Himiko is officially Izuku's girlfriend? His mind pondered this as she ran her hand through his curly green tinted hair while humming. This is nice, he thought and very much needed, especially after the anxiety-induced few weeks he has been experiencing. It all started after the faithful night of Himiko's confession and his subsequent acceptance to start dating his friend. His mother had given the news that Detective Tsukachi visited her in the day and told her that Yamaha, the boy whom he mistakenly attacked, was found dead in his home. Izuka later found out much later that the police found him drained of almost all his blood which was missing. That raised his paranoia through the roof and he kept his head on a swivel for days, going to school and coming back home which was inconvenient since he literally just got a girlfriend. 
It wasn't long until the paranoia was toned down thanks mostly to Himiko herself who worked wonders in calming him and his mother down. So he was ready to restart his training, which was about the time he hit his second speed bump. His training ground which was virtually cleared of all trash had now become a popular hangout spot for couples. On the bright side with a girlfriend now he still had a legitimate reason to hang around the place, not that he bothered anymore. Luckily by that time he had devoted most of his time to training with Silver Fong so it was more of an inconvenience rather than a setback. However recently a string of murders have gotten him on edge, granted it wasn't anywhere near their neighborhood but if you ask him it was too close nonetheless. Especially since his mother has to commute to and from work in that general area. At least there are more heroes patrolling the streets now. But still. What are you worrying about this time? Izuka looked at Himiko's face. A frown adorned it. It's nothing. You're a terrible liar, Izuku. She said frankly without a hint of mirth. Now tell me. She lowered her head, her hair falling down in a shower of golden strands. Izuka bit his lip and tried to turn away but she gently nudged his head back to look at her. He would avert his eyes but that became harder to do with how progressively close she got to take up most of his vision. By the time he finally caved their noses were touching. His eyes closed in bliss yet the nagging feeling of worry still plagued the dark recess of mind. Goodbye Midoriya-san. The single mother responded in kind towards her co-worker having finished for the day she headed out and made her way to the bus stop. It had been a miracle she managed to find a well-enough-paying job after she moved from her old neighborhood. She had only managed to break even with the money she gained from selling her old house to buying another. Luckily it hadn't taken that long and she was able to receive her first paycheck in conjunction to when she had to pay utilities. It just seems like her luck has gotten better ever since she moved. After the horrible incident with her son and Katsuki she had been racked with guilt. She always suspected her son was being bullied. At one point she was convinced of it but she has a perpetual weakness to her son she would put her faith in him that he would confide to her his problems. He did not. She felt guilt at not only finding out too late but also hurt that Izuka had not told her of this so she could do something about it sooner. Later she would learn he didn't want to make her worry. Inko was shocked. Worry? Worry. Inko knew she was a worry wart but that was just ridiculous and at the same time it was sad. Sad in how her nine-year-old son perceived her to be so weak that she couldn't handle a bit of worry. The fact that he would perceive her to be a worry-filled dependent person instead of a strong adult role model made her equal parts sad and upset. A parent was supposed to protect her child from the dangers of the world, not the other way around. It was all her fault though. She was always like this. She let the pressure of the outside world get to her. She couldn't hide it from her son never thought to really. Why would she ever hide her feelings? She was his mother, a responsible independent woman raising him by herself. That had to count for something, right? No, it does not, not to Izuku and not so soon. He wasn't old enough to understand the concept of everyday sacrifice. The most he could tell you about self-sacrifice is the sacrifice a hero makes every day in saving the life of civilians but not the sacrifices a modern single mother makes in raising her child. She could not blame him for his ignorance, he was still a child despite his keen intellect. She hated it. Not the thought process of her son, she could never hate him, but of her own weakness perceived and actual. Inko was aware of her shortcomings, she was not a strong woman, not physically or mentally, but she could at least try to persevere if not for herself then for her son. Heavens knows she had been through much in her life an abusive household, a husband who abandoned her at her time of need. But everything was worth it whenever she looked on her child's face. Izuku had also been through much despite his age, and for now he has become stronger for it, and Inko in turn has become from that. The enthusiasm Izuku exudes on an almost daily basis in the Midoriya household is infectious. She has never seen Izuku smile so genuinely this frequently, and for once it wasn't about another hero. No, the rant-like speeches he gave around dinner time about discoveries in a new quirk was all him. His accomplishments, his discoveries, how he could apply them was all him. Inko had never been so proud. Izuku was a shoe-in for Yui because if the school was raising heroes and heroes inspired the public then Izuku was already one step ahead of his peers. That's right Inko wasn't afraid to admit it if asked. Her son, 
her little boy was her inspiration. He inspired her to better herself in a way that she didn't think was possible for a fourteen-year-old. Inko was now more confident in herself, enough that she was able to swallow her self-consciousness of the past and join Izuku in his morning exercises. She could tell he held back for her which would have been a blow to her pride except she was too busy being in awe that Izuka could do this amount of rigorous training every day without fail. The thought pushed her to new grounds, which gave her a sense of accomplishment that in turn boosted her confidence. It had been a month since she started Izuka's training which also extended to a change in diet and things have been looking up for her ever since. She'd even noticed a few of her male co-workers giving her looks now which was flattering but she wasn't ready to start dating again, not yet. Maybe in a few years when Izuku becomes a pro hero she might consider. In her musings she had arrived at home and as always she was the first, Izuku operated like clockwork and with the recent murders he had taken to arrive before sunset as per her instructions. She would expect her and Himiko back any minute now, yet another blessing to have been bestowed on the Midoriya family. Izuka had a girlfriend. It was something she dreamed of happening but being the type of person he was she hadn't bothered to hold her breath. Then she met Himiko Toga. She was a strange one, not in a bad way more quirky than anything. Inko could tell the girl had an infatuation with her son. The way how she would smile wider when talking about him was almost like she was swooning when she mentioned how hard he worked. Then the very next day they were a couple. Now that came out of nowhere. She had expected them to take it slow, but she had come to realize that Himiko was the type of girl to take what she wants. She liked her son, then she confessed to him, and there was no way Izuka could reject her, and they have been together ever since. It was nice having someone else looking out for her son and even helping around the house. At least this time she could see that the girl had only good intentions and wasn't secretly doing anything nefarious behind her back. Izuku was a different kind of nervous whenever talks about their time together came up in conversation. Ah, young love? By the time she entered the house the sun had already set. Izuku and Himiko would be home any minute now so she went upstairs to her room to take a bath. Even though it was routine for her at this point she paused to look around. Something felt off. It wasn't something she could visibly identify but there was something wrong here. The feeling increased the further inside she got to the point where her heart beat faster. Inko was nervous, she'd had moments like this before, particularly when she was alone. Inko Midoriya was no stranger to fear but there would always be a prevalent explanation for her feelings. Right now it just felt wrong, off. HRR. Inko jumped, almost squeaked in alarm when she heard the faint sound coming from behind the door to her room. Sweat formed on her brow the fear reaching a fever pitch, she started retreating with her gaze still fixed to the door. Crash. Something smashed through the door and Inko froze as the seven-foot-tall man wearing a dark hood turned towards her. She couldn't see his face but she could feel his eyes roaming over her increasingly shivering form. For a split second their eyes meet and he grinned. Inko was greeted by jagged, disfigured teeth as the man advanced at a brisk pace. Inko didn't think for a second— the moment he twitched she ran, descending the stairs as fast as she's able towards the door. Something impaled her leg and she fell down the rest of the flight of stairs. She ended up crashing the back of her head on the wall. Her vision was blurry and her ears rang but she could make out words being spoken by the man. By the time her vision cleared as he saw him making his way down at an almost leisurely pace, her leg was bleeding and useless. She didn't care and pulled herself up beginning to limp to the door. She didn't make it two steps before something impaled her other leg and she fell flat on her face. Looking back she whimpered when she saw the instrument of her disability rip itself from her leg and back into the man's mouth. It was a tooth. He was using his teeth to attack her. Flesh so pretty. She heard him growl. Tears started running down her face as she made to crawl away. The path to the door not more than ten feet away seemed to stretch on for miles. Her palms were impaled next and a scream tore through her mouth. She felt several more of his teeth impale her body causing her to lose her voice. The combination of pain and unbridled fear caused her mind to slowly shut down to preserve itself. Show me more flesh, so pretty. Inko fell unconscious in a pool of her own blood. Himiko and Izuku walked hand in hand with a smile their face and skip in her step at least in Himiko's case. 
Izuku was still recovering from the passionate makeout session Himiko, once again, instigated in the backyard of the dojo. He didn't really know how much time had passed one moment they were watching the evening sun the next thing he knew the sun had gone down, and Silver was in the process of throwing them out his dojo. So it was that Himiko started to basically lead him home, while he sorted his mind out. Months of dating and he still couldn't get used to some of his girlfriend's quirks but in his defense her kisses were frequent, and frankly out of this world. It's now a known fact at school that he has a girlfriend which is inconvenient because a lot of people, jealous guys, kept hassling him about it. Apparently it was against the laws of nature for a quirkless loser to have a girlfriend let alone a cute one. And they made sure to confront her on that since he's decker then it means he must have an angle, lies, money, blackmail etc. As if he could even do any of those things to Himiko. He went to defend himself but Himiko beat him to the punch and the looks on their faces when she was finished tearing into them verbally, with a cheerful fake smile, was something that would forever be ingrained in his memory. Priceless. Also the look on his face when she capped her award-winning speech with a deep kiss in front of the already broken boys, and every single passerby, would be something forever ingrained in their memory. Also priceless. At least for a while anyway, Izuka wasn't afraid to demonstrate the fruits of his training if the need arises, which thankfully didn't. The one silver lining about this school compared to his last was the zero-tolerance policy it held when it comes to quirk abuse and bullying. They tried to get him outside of the school in some misguided revenge plot but that plan went south when Himiko gave them the look. Even Izuku was scared of the look, and why shouldn't he? Himiko can be scary when she wants to be. Speaking of Izuku had noticed the gradual slow down of their trek the closer they came towards the house. Then they stopped as Himiko took the time to observe the building. All the lights were on. Nothing seemed out of place but Himiko still looked suspicious. Himiko? Something's wrong. Her eyes narrowed as she approached. Something stinks she thought actually smelling the air lightly like. Without another word she ran the rest away with Izuku following close behind. Himiko what's wrong? She didn't answer and instead opening the door, both teens froze at the sight that greeted them. Inko Midoriya laid sprawled on the ground with her eyes closed. A hooded man in dark clothes hovered over her. His long, jagged, disfigured teeth were covered in blood. Izuka froze in shock and fear as the man regarded them. Himiko on the other hand acted immediately. Her expression blank she leapt across the room and landed a flying kick across his face. He flew with the force of her impact, and Himiko landed. Izuka get her out of here! She shouted reaching for her thighs only to curse as her box cutter was not there. It hasn't been for weeks now. Her eyes drifted to the kitchen where she knew the cutlery was located before cartwheeling away from a string of teeth that seemed to follow her. Don't get in my way. I want to see her innards. The man shouted. Himiko ignored his crazed outburst and made her to the kitchen only to be barred by a several rows of teeth that sprouted jagged spikes in her direction. Himiko back flipped away though she got nicked on her arm and chest. The wounds were superficial though so she paid them no mind as she now had another problem. The man isn't as stupid as she thought. Damn it, I'm no good without a weapon she cursed leaping back only to hit a wall. With trepidation she realized the man had her covered on all sides. A bead of sweat rolled down her face as she saw the crazed look of manic glee and hunger in the man's eyes. Let me see your insides. He drooled and the teeth surrounding her speared forward. Not a moment later they were all smashed apart by a giant black tentacle that swept the room and coiled around the man. Himiko's shocked gaze instantly turned towards Izuku and she gasped. The very air around him was warping, twisting in black like a stain on white. His eyes were a dull black-green. I, Izuku? Himiko felt a shiver go down her spine when their eyes met, then he looked down at the motionless Inko before uttering two words that had her suppress another shudder. Take her. Then all hell broke loose. The lights were the first to go the bulbs within the vicinity spontaneously exploding in a shower of glass and sparks. The second thing to happen was for the man to retaliate, or try to any way Izuka pulled him close and with a giant fist made of shadow punched him through the room. Izuka followed after him deeper in the house in a concentrated swirl of darkness that seemed to swallow the lights as he glided towards the maniac. Himiko didn't think twice. She went to Inko's side ignoring the sounds of battle to check on the woman's injuries. Shit, he severed an artery in her leg. 
That seemed to be the source of most of the blood on the floor, but it wasn't the only one. There was a large cut on her back near her spine that looked to have been carved out. I want to see her innards. The words echoed in her mind, and she scowled that bastard. She wanted to kill him. She wanted to stab him with a butcher knife so many times not even for the blood, just to see the light leave his eyes. There was a louder crash and Himiko left Inko for a moment to see that both the Zuku and the maniac were gone. She could faintly hear sounds of conflict outside. Taking a deep breath Himiko forced herself not to pursue Izuku can take care of himself. She went for the phone but hesitated upon picking it up. Himiko had an abhorrence for police but a quick glance to the dying woman on the floor made her change her mind. Meanwhile Izuku felt like a third wheel inside his own body. The moment he saw his mother face down in a puddle of blood something in him snapped. It all went downhill from there. His mind became semi-lucid. Darkness creeped at the edge of his vision yet his body moved of its own volition. The sensation was jarring. Izuku had control yet he didn't feel in control of himself. It was like he was playing a video game character of himself. The only thing he could do was guide his body into doing certain actions and hope it gets carried out. They do in a way but it's usually hit and miss and not in the way he had hoped. The only thing that does seem to register as the prime objective and side objective for him in this game called life were the following. Defeat the villain. Avoid the light. And Dark Izuka seemed to carry out these objectives with brutal, in, efficiency. That's the thing about not being fully in control Izuka wasn't nearly as good as he could be in this situation since his brain's orders seemed to pass through a muddled filter. All the training he did with Silver was rendered moot. His brilliant mind had been muted and any plans he might have had were effectively thrown out the window. On the other hand the man, though obviously insane, was a good fighter. He easily had Izuku beat in speed and maneuverability, while Izuku had more raw power but without proper coordination he was at a disadvantage. Izuku was knocked to the ground where he rolled away from being skewered and thrust his palm out sending a thick shadow tendril the man moved away from at the cost of some of his teeth formation. He seemed unperturbed though as the broken off teeth seemed to grow back and attack with a vengeance. He leapt away using the shadow to propel himself from the onslaught before he got caught in luminance of a street light. Ah, he hissed in a moment as his power weakened. The moment of weakness was all the man needed to get him. Izuka made a wall of shadow but it hardly made a difference. The teeth speared through his barrier and pierced through his shoulder and leg. He screamed out in pain. A tentacle smashed the lights out and coiled around the offending object. Like Inca traveled until it ended up at the source, then without preamble slammed into his face, violently ripping out two his teeth at the root. The man yelled in pain but was coherent enough to leap aside from the follow-up. He retracted his tooth regarding the teen more warily than before. Izuka ripped the appendage from his person, his powers already cauterized the wounds, not that he needed his limbs. Using several tendrils he slowly rose, his eyes now more pitch black and staring into the soul of a maniac. Suddenly all the street's lights went out and several smashes in their vicinity encasing the area in darkness. Come again and be careful out there, the storm manager warned. Thank you, she greeted walking down the street. Things were a little hot right now, especially for women with the string of murders going around. Her pace was faster than normal as she made for home. She could see that the streets were empty. In fact, there was an entire section devoid of light. A power outage. Weird since the entire block is powered by a single fuse box. If there was something wrong with it then she would have needed her night vision goggles to continue walking. Not that it really mattered, she wasn't even headed in that direction so whatever was happening wasn't her problem. A body was sent flying from a dark corner and crashed into a car with enough force to cave in the metal door and obliterate the windows. She froze then pressed herself to the corner when the person pushed himself to his hands and knees. Her bags were dropped the moment she saw something fly out the dark and her hands fumbled around the pocket of her cargo pants. Come on, come on. Finally she took it out. A makeshift taser gun of her own design, it could charge up enough voltage to take down someone with thick skin, in theory. Although her theory was correct since it did take out that one guy with a brick skin quirk. Mutterings from the guy caught her attention, she cringed once she got a good look at him. He was beat up real bad, his face was disfigured, had a few teeth missing, blood was staining his clothes. 
She felt sorry for him, up until he noticed her looking and his eyes widened in manic glee in conjunction with his teeth. Before he could fully stand though a giant fist made of darkness smashed him back into the car earning a startled gasp from her. The appendage slithered back into the darkness, and out came someone else. He was short, shorter than her, his back was hunched, and he seemed to drag his feet. Not that she noticed what with his features literally being shadowed by darkness with writhing tentacles here and there. Her breathing became ragged as she backed away but that was the wrong thing to do as the walking silhouette paused its advance to the down man and slowly inclined its head in her direction. She let out a gasp at the visage of abnormally dark eyes staring at her. The street lights flickered as its entire body turned in her direction. She held up her trembling hands pointing the gun at him. Stay back. It inclined its head at the rather toy-looking gun then at the girl before reaching out its hand. I dash. She pressed the trigger and five barbs sprung from the mechanism onto its chest charred by thirty thousand volts of pure electricity. The electricity was actually visible as it sparked off its body in arcs. Through the light show and agonizing screams that made her cringe she could see the shadow peel off of him like smoke off a fire. By the time it was finished the now revealed young boy with unruly black-green hair was blasted back by the force where his body crashed to the ground in a boneless, smoking heap. She stayed at that position for a while trying to get her trembling under control when she heard a groan. With a click she discharged a five pairs of quadruple-A batteries. Hissing as the smoking material hit the ground, she had to knock one out of the cartridge as it basically melted inside, all the while she kept the boy's prone body in sight. She loaded up the makeshift ammunitions, fumbling a little with the last she clicked the cartridge into place and held it up towards the boy who had now began to move. Ugh! He slowly began to shift his slightly twitching body. She could hear sirens coming from the distance and getting louder. Despite herself, she couldn't help but smile at the situation she stumbled upon. She could practically see the headlines now. She wasn't stupid. A string of murders happening and she just so happens to stumble upon an attempted murder. This had headlines written all over it and with the publicity she could. Her monologue paused as the other guy woke up. She completely forgot about him. Hey guy, are you okay? She questioned still keeping her eyes on Shadow Man. He didn't answer. His breathing was ragged and but she could have sworn she heard him mumble under his breath. She still didn't pay him any mind mostly because the boy was finally on his hands and knees breathing hard. He looked up with bleary eyes clearly not all there and she paused. Why does this guy look so familiar to her? After a few moments she realized no way. Midoriya san the name seemed to jolt him into awareness as he looked to her but just as quickly his eyes darted to the side and widened in panic. Look out! She spun around aiming her supercharged taser but didn't get a chance to fire as something impaled through the gun forcing her to let go and drop back on her butt and scramble away. Looming over her was the previously thought victim, his mouth filled with deadly lengthened jagged teeth that seemed ready to stab her. He tilted his head to consider her before rows of teeth converged like a released arrow. She saw it coming in slow motion her vision zoomed into the point where she could make out the gross finer details. Then she was tackled to the side narrowly missing death but obscuring her vision as she landed on her chest. There was a grunt and a bright light followed by an explosion and shout. She was literally shaken from her terror-induced stupor as her vision returned to normal. Midoriya had a fiercely determined look yet at the same time she could see his fear. I it's going to be all right, I'm here. He was acting brave, trying to be a hero but he wasn't a pro. He was just a kid like her with no training and if the rumors were true then he was worse off than she was. His hands lit up with two glowing orbs of light that he threw at the incoming rows of teeth. Run away, I will hold him off. She scrambled back but didn't immediately leave. You sure about that? No offense, but you just took thirty thousand volts to the chest. He glanced at her. Oops. He rubbed his chest with a grimace. So that's what that was. He mumbled. Sorry. It's okay. He cut himself off when he attacked again, forcing Izuku to whip out a shadow tendril to scoop her up and another to yank them away via street light. What kind of quirk is this? She saw him throw balls of light, and now he's whipping out dark tendrils no way. 30,000 volts. How am I still alive? That is by far the most his durability had been tested which was a shock, no pun intended. 
although it explains why he's feeling pain in his chest. It was difficult but not too difficult to breathe and the constant movement wasn't doing him any favors and that was while his dark quirk was numbing most of the pain. That much power applied directly to someone's chest could stop someone's heart a couple times over. How did she even manage to get a weapon? Because he saw one, like that. She was his age. Gah! He fell short but didn't dare drop the girl and instead ducked into a dark corner making sure to kill the street light. He was really hoping the police sirens would deter the criminal while he gathered his bearings. He could still push himself but he didn't want to press his chances against a psychopathic villain while he wasn't at 100%. He kept his ear out in case they were followed but once the coast was clear he leaned against the wall and slid down with a huff. He really felt like taking a nap right now. He yelped when someone grabbed his shoulder but calmed once he came face to face with the girl he had saved. I is he gone? Izuka swallowed. I'm not sure. Stay here. Are you out of your mind? Maybe he thought but didn't deign to answer the question. Should have brought the flashbangs. He heard her mumble. Flashbangs? He regarded her with a confused expression from his peripherals before they widened in shock. She turned a second later in time to see a wide-open maw of razor-sharp extending teeth closing in on her face. To Izuka's surprise instead of freezing up, as he would have likely have done, the girl did an impressive dive to the side narrowly missing the deranged man. Izuka reacted in that moment with his expression schooled in conviction he did an uppercut putting all his weight behind it, and with a mighty yell of, SMASH! A giant fist of shadow leapt from the ground and crashed under his chin knocking out most of his teeth and knocked him into the air. In the brief rain of teeth and blood the man miraculously gained consciousness two stories up and a pair of his teeth latched onto to the two buildings. He glared hatefully at the small panting boy with blood dripping from his toothless gums. You hinder me, no more die! His mouth opened impossibly wide and teeth shot out like missiles. Die! Izuka's fist balled and he cocked his fist back as a pool of shadows gathered beneath his form. Plus Ultra! The moment he let his fist fly, a shadow twice as large as his body shot from the ground temporarily obscuring his body and formed into a giant fist that easily smashed through the sharp teeth like they were styrofoam. The fist impacted the man sent him through the side of the building where it soared across the street and landed with a dull crack. For a moment he laid still then twitched. Bam! A shadow fist stomped him down where he remained unmoving and Izuka released his dark powers feeling the warmth returned. Is it over? Izuka nearly jumped at the voice but was truly too tired to react much. I think so. He turned to look at the girl. Hey, are you alright? I'm fine but... The girl looked him up and down. You don't look so good. He didn't feel so good either. The edges of his vision were growing darker. I thought you didn't have a queer hey. The remark sounded sarcastic but at that point Izuka was too far gone and he fainted. Katsuki's fingers drummed against his leg. He was anxious and just a bit scared. He hated that fact. Fear wasn't something Katsuki was accustomed to. Oh he had a taste of it in his younger years and that one isolated incident with his mother not so recently, which will not be remembered, but nowadays Katsuki would usually curb stomp his fear into the ground and double tap it with an explosion to make sure it knew its place. Now the Sonova bitch was back with a vengeance, and this time Katsuki didn't have the means to put it down. It's not like his fear, God he hated that word, was a person or object he could fight slash kill and it's not like it was internal so he could rationalize. No the worst kind of fear for someone like Katsuki Bakugo wasn't fear for himself, it was fear for someone else. Beyond those doors leading to the ICU Inko Midoriya was in the middle of surgery. Apparently she suffered from some a few yet lethal, she lost a lot of blood, had internal bleeding and Katsuki would rather not think of the exact details. And during all this Katsuki noted that Izuka wasn't there with them in the lobby but Katsuki wasn't too worried about him oddly. That idiot was probably in another room being treated for stupidly trying to protect her from the villain. He wasn't surprised that his guess was partly right and Izuka was in fact unconscious in another room in a separate wing being treated for his injuries and exhaustion from overuse of his quirk. Katsuki didn't go to see him because he's pretty sure if he did see Deku's face he would most likely finish what that villain started. 
It didn't matter that Azuka not only stopped but defeated a villain slash psycho slash serial killer slash cannibal, and it didn't matter that he managed to save another civilian while he was at it. What did matter to Katsuki was that the little fucker left Inko bleeding out on the ground of his living room to do it instead of calling the cops. If Katsuki was being honest he felt disappointed and confused but mostly pissed he would do that, just left his own mother to go be a hero to someone else. What? The. Fuck? This was all explained to him by his mother after her inquiry to the lead investigator, the would-be victim, her parents and Izuka's girlfriend. What? The. Fuck. Katsuki had no business prying into someone's romantic life, least of all Dekka's, but that particular revelation made the man pause and at that moment he felt the universe shift right around him. Now that conversation took place roughly an hour ago, the girl Dekka saved was long gone, and since Katsuki absolutely refused to see him he has been stuck waiting in the lobby. Up until a few minutes ago his mother and Dekka's girl, he didn't bother learning her name, were with Deku. He said a few minutes ago because they had seemingly gotten tired of seeing his sorry ass. In reality visiting hours were about to be over and they wanted an update on Inko. Thankfully the doctor informed that she was now stable and will make a recovery, physically. Inko and Katsuki, and his mother's, opinion was an emotional mess most of the time and is the one person they knew who was even worse than Deku, because who did he get it from? If her son getting into a dangerous fight was enough to have her move as far from the neighborhood as feasibly possible then how much worse would she be after almost getting killed? Katsuki cursed under his breath. This family was going to be death of him. It's terrible. Katsuki red gaze turned to the only other teen presumably his age. Deku's girlfriend he reminded himself then there was that feeling of how wrong that felt, or maybe it was just her. Looking at the girl now, tall, Blonde and fairly pretty with worry in her yellow slit-like eyes Katsuki was genuinely surprised that this was that idiot's choice for a girlfriend. If one were to ask him on a very, very, very good day who he thought someone like Deku would end up with then Katsuki would probably answer. He'd go for someone like his mom or someone like my mom. No, he does not have a complex with mothers or mother types it was simple psychology from what he has observed from types like Deku. The only female he was remotely comfortable with was Inko so it was reasonable to say he would seek out a meek girl who fusses over everything like her. Or if he was a glutton for punishment, or secretly a masochist, like his father then he would attract someone like his own mother, someone who wouldn't put up with his crap and straighten him out, though that could be fifty fiftieths. For some inexplicable reason in spite of his mother's attitude his father somehow had her wrapped around his finger despite being a complete pussy. He would never understand girls and at this point he didn't care to anymore. Speaking of girls, she had been staring at him for a while now and it was starting to piss him off. What are you looking at? He snapped. He gave her credit for not flinching like most would. Instead she gave him an appraising look before she spoke. Isaacun was right about you. The fuck is that supposed to mean? He demanded. She answered nonchalantly. Oh nothing. She looked to the sky in a whimsical manner. I should go now, places to be, someone to see. With that she took on a leisurely stroll humming a tune while her hands flexed behind her back. Katsuki felt a tingle go down his spine at he last word as she departed. She wasn't normal not like a regular girl should, at least he's sure regular girls don't react the way she did towards him. Somehow Izuka had detracted from his expectations yet again. It was an insignificant thing but this girl was anything but... There was something decidedly off about the girl who claims to be Deku's girlfriend. If that is even true. Hey! She paused and looked over her shoulder curiously. Just who the hell are you anyway? He wasn't expecting her to smile at him. I'm Izakun's girlfriend, of course. She answered as if she was talking to a child. I want a name, damn it! He snapped, getting more and more pissed at not being taken seriously, at being underestimated, at... Himiko Toga, she answered easily though with finality as if she expected, at least to Katsuki, that he would acknowledge her. He didn't. Katsuki spat at the side and turned his back to her obviously finished with the conversation though she wasn't apparently. Bye bye. Katsuki almost rolled his eyes at the childishness in her voice. Kaken, Katsuki froze in place. No one, absolutely no one called him that name since kindergarten. 
The childish nickname had been lost to the ages and frankly it felt insulting to be called such. He hadn't been a kid for a long time. The only person who he would allow to get away with it were his family, and only the older ones or Inko and by grudging extension once upon a time Deku. For her to call him that, and in such a way that it sounded intentionally mocking was an affront to his pride. There was no question who she had learned that nickname from and he could swear he heard the little shit laughing to him now. The thought made his palms started sweating in preparation for an explosion. His expression had a nasty snarl as he whipped around ready to show her just why Decca had moved away from their old neighborhood. He wouldn't hurt her of course but he would renovate that smirk off her face for sure. Except that he didn't, couldn't actually because Himiko Toga was nowhere in sight the second it took for him to turn around after she spoke not ten feet away from him. Katsuki's bewildered expression slowly melted away as he straightened his posture and looked around. There are a number of definitively plausible reasons why she could up and disappear but Katsuki refused to dwell on them. He wasn't about to spend any more of his energy thinking about Deku or his girlfriend. Inko was safe, the criminal was caught and Deku would live to be defeated by him another day. Everything was as it should be. The next day. The villain serial killer, dubbed Moonfish, responsible for a string of recent murders was found dead this morning in his containment cell. The inmate who was slated for death row was discovered by the escort security team with his throat and wrist slashed. Sources in the coroner's office confirmed that the cause of death was severe blood loss. One of the officers on duty for the night watch was allegedly found unconscious outside the facility having apparently been knocked out with his personal effects being stolen dash. The television clocked off. Well Himichan, it looks like you've been a busy girl. The fallout after the incident with Moonfish made the local news. Of course it did Moonfish was a serial killer and cannibal too of the absolute worst things to ever come out of human society. No it wouldn't be a stretch to say that it was the absolute worst of humanity on a whole. The criminal would have been on death row if he had actually been tried and sentenced however Moonfish was killed while in detainment. That had made his name appear in headlines for at least a week but it was downplayed once it was leaked exactly how he was apprehended. The dangerous criminal Moonfish whom had managed to evade the combined efforts of the police and the heroes was beaten by a lone middle school student who came home one night to see his mother being assaulted by him. That brought the entirety of West Japan in an uproar and the media took every advantage to make their story sell and sell it did. Everyone wanted to know about the brave young boy who stood up to a villain in order to protect his mother. Full investigations into his background was launched. Interviews with anyone who has ever been in contact with him commenced, some more successful than others and ranging from truthful to downright lies. To the media it was the story of the year, to the public it was inspiring but to the few people who have ever known or at least heard of Izuka Midoriya before then, it was a shock because until then everyone had assumed he was just a corkless nobody, a Deku. Throughout all of this though, no one had seen the boy since the incident, reporters staked out his home, the hospital and some of the more dedicated even ran along his alleged jogging route in order to catch the boy during his workout routine. They had no such luck though, the boy never showed up and as far as they knew he was still stuck in the hospital. That was about a month ago and as the story started to lose steam everyone was still wondering. Where is Izuka Midoriya? Smack. Izuka winced as the bamboo struck his skin sensei really isn't holding back today either. Silver walked around his student eyeing him as if he were judging an animal he wanted to buy as a pet and Izuka couldn't help but whimper like one when he struck his biceps. His arm trembled and he fought not to release the content of the ceramic jug he was currently gripping. It was about 6 a.m. in the morning and Silver was having Izuka squatting over a burning needle held precariously under his crotch while in each arm he gripped two heavy ceramic jugs of water. The exercise significance is threefold as not only will it improve Izuka's gripping power, the constant striking of his muscles will cause them to harden and finally he had to maintain this pose through intense concentration lest he slip up and drop the pot or his legs give up and he fell on the needle. Either of those held very terrible consequences for the young man. There was also another catch. He also had to regulate the amount of his quirks so his wound would remain. It was something Silver was recently having Izuku improve in. Honestly speaking Izuku didn't see the merit in restricting his automatic solar regeneration. 
Silver would have none of it though and gave him an entire lecture on the importance of having true mastery of his quirk. Think of it like this, if you can control your most basic passive ability then you will be able to fine-tune it absorb as much or as little energy as you want. The appeal of absorbing more than what he currently could did appeal to him. Instead of waiting all day in the sun he could heal himself faster, and if he applied that same ultra-absorbing technique to minor injuries, or even some fatal wounds then he could be virtually invincible. Now that made Izuku go ahead with his sensei's idea unfortunately in his thoughts of what the future might bring he momentarily forgot the pothole filled, razor wired, dirt road ahead of him to get to that point. But just as he said to himself when he laid sprawled out in various forms of exhaustion not too long ago it will all be worth it. Smack. Izuku's body trembled then stilled, his energy revitalized by his quirks passive yet forcibly restrained by his will to a degree where the angry welts were still visible. It will be worth itit will be worth itit will be worth it. Yet again his mind wandered to ignore the pain and piercing gaze of his sensei. For the rest of his break Izuka decided to move into Silver's dojo for the time being. Both to escape from the reporters, or vultures as Silver would call them and as a way to keep his mind and body preoccupied from thoughts of his mother and what could have been. Midoriya Inko, while alive, was still hospitalized pending a full recovery, thank the gods. She had gotten medical leave with pay and her hospital bills were being covered by a mysterious benefactor known simply as SF. As if he was fooling anyone. Izuku had made sure to visit her every day mostly out of obligation and partly out of guilt. He was unconscious throughout most of it but there was a chance that she wouldn't have made it if Himiko didn't know what she was doing. This was the same thing he went through with his first encounter with a villain, he reacted without thinking and ended up mixing his priorities. Obviously he should have brought his mother to safety rather than trying to fight off the villain, a villain who would have most likely overpowered and killed him, than his mother and Himiko if he had any other quirk. It was stupid but the moment he saw his mother face down in a pool of her own blood his mind completely shut down and his dark instincts took over. Even then when he had some semblance of control did he ever think of his mother? No he simply left her in Himiko's care. Now was that neglect of his only family on his part? Or did he simply trust Himiko to know what she was doing? Of course he leaned to the former more than the latter since he had no idea Himiko knew basic first aid and in any other situation it would have been him leaving his mother to die in a stranger's arms. He wanted no needed to be better and it brought him great shame that he had failed his mother in that way. Not even his triumph over Moonfish had made that revelation any better and he'd heard from Himiko that even Katsuki was more concerned with his mother's health than raging over the fact that he beat a villain. He knew his friend and he knew he would definitely have a problem with how he defeated a villain before him it only seemed natural. You know you really messed up when Katsuki Bakugu remained silent in the face of someone outshining him. He never saw his friend but from the scant times Himiko had seen him it seemed that Kaken hadn't changed much and in fact it might have gotten worse if the message Himiko relayed was anything go by. Tell that useless bastard to watch himself next year. I'll knock him down from his high horse soon enough. Ah, Kaken, don't ever change, Izuka thought wistfully. Hey, at the very least, Katsuki acknowledged that he had a chance in Yui. Whether it was nervousness or excitement, Izuka didn't know, but he could definitely say without a shadow of a doubt he wasn't afraid of that challenge. His past bullying seemed so far away he could hardly remember them. So much has happened since. One thing is for certain, though. If Kaken really was the same and was expecting for them to pick up where they left off with him being the hapless victim then he was in for a rude awakening. Smack. Ow. Oh. Speaking of rude awakening, that was not Azuka's voice. Your arms were lowering. Silver's impassive voice sounded from further away. Izuka couldn't help but turn his gaze to the proceedings. And hitting them with that stick is supposed to help? Himiko's irate voice sounded. Oh yes. It hadn't only been Izuku training this morning, Himiko had decided to join him as well. Her reasons were a little vague but Izuku knew that looking after his mother had struck a chord with her. If I had been stronger. He remembered her saying and he also remembered that while he froze she was the one to attack first and drove the villain off his mother. Himiko was strong, stronger and more skilled than a girl her age should be. 
He remembered her saying that her last trainer was a veteran soldier who was also passionate about teaching. He just didn't know how far his teachings went but now he did. As it stood Himiko was just as skilled if not even more so than himself, and she took to Silver's training like a fish out of water. She also had a remarkable pain threshold which made him and Sensei wonder just what the heck kind of training she did. At this point Izuku was sure that her complaining and snide remarks were just a way to get on Silver's nerves. Maybe if you spent time concentrating on your stance instead ogling my student I wouldn't have to enforce such disciplinary actions. Silver said once again blocking her view of Izuku. Said boy couldn't help but blush he was after all shirtless and in shorts so Silver could see his muscle development. And yes Izuku did have muscles and abs. It wasn't anything overtly noticeable but it wasn't anything to scoff at either. For someone his age at least. Himiko in true Himiko fashion had made it clear she approved of his developing physique. Likewise Izuku has also approved of the way she approves of his biceps by constantly hanging off of his arm and pressing her developing chest onto them. But that is a story for another time. What? He's a healthy young boy and Himiko is a pretty girl. And his girlfriend, you can't possibly blame him for noticing something so obvious. It's not like she's hiding her apparent lust for him either. Otherwise Silver wouldn't have felt the need to place their rooms on the complete opposite ends of his dojo with the only way to get to each other's rooms is to pass by his own. So far Izuku has woken up to Himiko tied up to the naughty log outside fourteen times. Izuku snickered a little at the memory, and got smacked in the face with a pebble for his troubles. Eyes forward Izuku! Silver intoned absently using the stick to juggle a significantly larger pebble. Yes, sensei! Ugh, I'm beat! Himiko yawned dropping her head on Izuku's shoulder. Izuki gave a nervous laugh as some eyes were on him. Luckily the boy had taken to wearing a green and black hoodie ensemble with matching black pants and green shoes. That still didn't detract that PDA attracted some gazes. If they had been older most would think it was too much but as it stood most found it adorable. They were a young couple and seeing Himiko sleepily resting her head against his while hanging on his arm like a grown-up was cute in its own way. Still Izuku preferred not to draw much attention especially on his way to visiting the hospital. It wouldn't be so bad if you didn't antagonize Sensei. Humph, <laughs> she pouted. All I did was tell him the truth. You called him decrepit old man who should be featured in a museum. He deadpanned. So? She pouted. Have you seen him? Izuka could only shake his head at her. She straightened up as they walked through a thrum of people while Izuka kept his gaze down. As he thought there were a few more reporters in the general vicinity, Himiko had showed him how to spot them in a crowd. It was easier than he thought, someone must have tipped them off about his mother being released today. At her behest and Mr. S.F.'s generous monetary backing Inko wouldn't be released from the hospital until she had recovered her full mental and physical faculties. Today just so happened to be the day, and while there had not been as much reporters hungry for an interview news of his mother's discharge had most likely leaked and a few eager vultures would surely want to grab an exclusive interview with her or maybe even catch him so Azuka kept his head low, as he walked making sure not to give anyone a glimpse of his curly hair. That should have been the plan when someone bumped into him and suddenly his world got a little brighter. Wait, what? Hey, aren't you that kid who beat that villain Moonfish? As if one of those silent dog whistle was blown every person affiliated with journalism perked up and soon eyes were on him. Even then people who kept up with current events started congregating, trying to catch a glimpse of the boy hero who put the dangerous criminal behind bars. Himiko had made herself scarce before that sentence was finished. Her identity would hopefully remain anonymous to them. It was a miracle that her name hadn't gotten out there in the first place. She was instead relegated to a school friend who called the local police. Izuku abruptly had a recorder stuck in his face and a string of questions thrown at him. For a moment Izuku froze and gulped. He had seen All Might do this a hundred times on TV. How does he make it look so easy? He was so nervous the only thing that came out of his mouth was sputtering until eventually he gave up on speaking and went to his default plan. Clenching his eyes shut he formed a light grenade and thrust his fist in the air. The light from his fist magnified to the point where to shine through his fingers and then he opened his palm. Solar Sphere 
The flash of light outshined the sun itself for a brief moment in that contained cluster of bodies that rendered everyone momentarily blind. Even Izuka saw spots for a moment, but the effect was somewhat stunted on him giving him a better recovery time and allowing him to slip away and run right into the hospital. As he ran inside the nurse at the front desk recognized him and upon seeing the reporters outside she ordered a few of the orderlies to lock the doors. Izuka breathed a sigh of relief. Thank you, miss. The woman smiled. It's no problem, Izuku. Her gaze shifted to the now crowded door and scowled. Izuka himself winced. Why are there so many of them? The nurse hummed. Well, I suppose people are still talking about what you did to Moonfish. Izuka looked at her in disbelief as he walked beside her. Be but that was weeks ago. Surely something could have happened to make it old news by now. The nurse laughed. Clearly you don't give yourself enough credit and— her expression turned just a bit serious. That villain Moonfish, he wasn't just some run-of-the-mill villain either, he's defeated heroes with years of experience before. I'll say it again, Izuku, it would be a miracle if anyone short of veteran heroes survived a confrontation with him, but how you managed to actually defeat him is... She trailed off and shook her head. I guess it doesn't matter so long as you survived, you must have one powerful quirk to pull it off. Izuka laughed nervously and gulped. He'd purposely avoided the topic of his quirk for some time now. He didn't know why he did it exactly because it's not as if he's going to get in trouble because of it. Really Izuku just didn't want the attention a quirk like his would give him, especially right now. As to the other topic of conversation Izuku had chills thinking about it, his fight with Moonfish. The nurse was right, his quirk was powerful enough to bridge the gap between a pro-villain and a semi-trained middle school kid. Add that fact to his state of mind and anyone could say that Izuku was really, very, undeniably lucky that night. It was literally a bad match-up for the villain, and Izuku had also caught him off guard with a surprise attack that hindered him. If that battle had deviated from how it was even by a little then, Izuku didn't want to think about what-ifs right now, they reached his mother's room. The nurse opened the door to see Inko on the bed looking as good as healed and talking to the doctor. The moment their eyes met they proved how they were truly related by shedding tears of relief and giving a simultaneous shout. Kei chan Izuku Kei-yuan! While Inko couldn't exactly move from her spot Izuku practically leapt across the room to hug her. The two hospital staff watched in silence as the mother and son held on to each other and shed tears together. The doctor eventually had to break them up by coughing into his fist. It took about two minutes to go over Inko's current health basically she was all right and that her health was relatively fine though he cautioned for her to take it easy. He also recommended a therapist for both of them to see which was surprising, at least it was for Izuku. Inko however nodded in agreement to the suggestion. Izuku didn't voice his complaint of having some of time taken away from further developing his body and quirk. After the incident, and his mother's very real near-death situation Izuku realized something upon watching her unconscious form one evening. Izuku hasn't done much with his mother in a long time, the thought hit him like a freight train. The potentially last time he would see his mother, and he hadn't any lasting memories of her. She was just, always there for him, in the house whenever he needed her, a near constant in his life he figured would always be there, like an NPC in a safe house if one were to be cruel about it. The comparison made him ill but it wasn't incorrect and Izuku realized that in his quest to become a great hero he was a lousy son. What was the point of being able to save lives if the most important person in his life ended up being tossed to the wayside? Was he actually ignorant, arrogant to believe that his mother was this immortal, untouchable being that could weather through anything? No she wasn't, his mother was just as vulnerable as him, even more so and this incident only serves to highlight this. But there was hope yet, he could salvage his relationship with his mother, and while the thought of going to therapy didn't appeal to him the thought of spending more time with his mother did. Izuka squeezed her hand and smiled nodding to the man. As the doctor left Inko's smile dropped. Izuku, where is Himiko? Oh now that I thought about it, she must have had some trouble getting in with all those reporters outside. Oh, his mother seemed mollified by this as she leaned back into the bed. I hope she's all right. Izuka smiled. Don't worry, Kaosan. Himiko can take care of herself. Where is he? Himiko had a scowl on her face as she tried and failed to spot her quarry. 
She had been on the hunt for a few minutes now and hadn't so much as caught a glimpse of him. Right now I should be with my Isaacuin and Inko. I swear when I get my hands on him her inner monologue cut once she spotted a suspicious-looking person with a hood over his head. Himiko saw a flash of teeth before the man started walking away, Himiko pursued. Izuku might not have noticed what happened earlier given the crowd and the fact that he had his head down, but Himiko saw everything. Someone had purposefully revealed him to the reporters, which wouldn't have warranted more than Himiko's disdain, but it was when he spoke that she became agitated. Himiko knew this person. And if he's here. She trailed off with a bad feeling developing in the pit of her stomach. Himiko tracked him down to a wide darkened alley that wasn't a cliché dead end. She was still cautious though, and the caution paid off as she managed to narrowly duck getting grappled from behind and sweep the perpetrator's leg from under him. She spun to her full height and attempted a stomp only for him to tilt his head to the side then push her using his foot to trip her up. Instead of stumbling Himiko did an elegant backflip to catch herself while reaching for her thigh holster. The man flipped up and spun into a roundhouse kick that caught her hand effectively kicking the weapon from her hand. Himiko growled as she had no choice but to engage him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Immediately put on the defensive by his flurry of well-coordinated attacks Himiko was helpless when the man finished off with a spinning back kick that launched her into the wall. Coincidentally it happened to be beside where her errant weapon, a butterfly knife, lay. Himiko grinned maniacally as she held it up like a serial killer and charged after him. The man was silent, but a mirrored grin could be seen under the hood even as he was forced on the defensive by Himiko's wild yet precise strikes. She jumped up and stabbed down towards his head. He used his wrist to block her own, but Himiko simply let go of the scissors and caught it in her left hand before stabbing it. The man reacted with shocking speed, grabbing her left hand and twisting it behind her painfully. Himiko's grin didn't waver as she tossed the weapon mid-twist and forced her body to do a corkscrew flip untwisting her arm while grabbing the weapon off the ground to stab it into the man's forearm. Surprisingly the blade didn't penetrate deep before it met resistance, he bled but not enough for Himiko's taste. TCH. She clicked her tongue and leapt back standing at her full height. Are we done here? The stranger looked to his bleeding arm and licked the blood from it, ignoring the way Himiko's face twitched at the action. Yes, he finally lowered down his hood to reveal a pale-faced man with short, shaggy black hair and bags under his yellow squinted eyes. Hello, Haim Chan. I miss you. The man ran at her open arms. Himiko stoically sidestepped his advance and folded her arms. Why are you here? The man looked at her hurt. Ah, uh, is that how you greet your brother after meeting again after so long? Shame on you, Haim Chan. I don't want to hear that from someone who thinks attacking his sister is a proper greeting, she shouted back. Ah, but I had to be sure, he said, his tone becoming darker. I wanted to know if the Heimchan I saw today with that boy was my Heimchan. Himiko stilled as her eyes gained an edge. What are you saying? Oh, nothing. It's just that I've never seen you smile like that in a long time. That boy must be really special if he survived this long with you. He gave her a coy look. Makes me want to meet him. Himiko's arms unfolded and she gave the man a murderous glare. Stay away from Izuku, he's mine. The man took a few steps back and held his hands up in surrender. Scary but don't worry, little boys aren't my type. He shrugged casually. Why are you here? I wanted to visit my Heimchan. At her glare he added. And I also have some personal business to take care of. When I'm done we can hang out together and when you're done... He left the sentence open as he exited the alleyway leaving Himiko by herself. The girl stood there for a minute before she collapsed, breathing heavily. Her hand trembled and her expression looked stricken. Why him? Why did it have to be him? Unknown to her the man leaned against the wall and smiled a Cheshire smile that practically split his face. This is part two on part three. I am working. Please wait for that. 